I'm your host, Charlie Dixon. My guests today are Elsbeth Moet and Freddie Zantel Weaver. Elsbeth and Freddie are founders of the Tantra Nova Institute in Chicago. This dynamic couple has over two decades of experience guiding more than 10,000 couples and singles towards lasting intimacy. Renowned for their expertise, they have been featured on Showtime's Sexual Healing and the Emmy Award winning NBC show Starting Over. As beloved life and business partners residing in Chicago, Elsbeth and Freddie share their insights globally, speaking at conferences, universities, and spiritual centers. Their impact is validated by the recognition in their best selling book, Sexual Enlightenment. Elsbeth and Freddie also serve as faculty members at the Art of Living Retreat Center in North Carolina. We're excited to have Elsbeth and Freddie with us today to discuss intimacy, spiritual expansion, and their book, Sexual Enlightenment, How to Create Lasting Fulfillment in Life, Love, and Intimacy. We're excited to have Elsbeth and Freddie with us today to discuss intimacy, spiritual expansion, and their book, Sexual Enlightenment, How to Create Lasting Fulfillment in Life, Love, and Intimacy. Welcome to the show. Thank yeah, you so much. Charlie. Great to be here, Charlie. Yes. Awesome. Awesome. So as we get started today, Elsbeth, can you um, try to take us through your journey on how you got into the work around sexual wellness? Yes, so um, my uh, path has been quite varied. As you can tell from my accent, I didn't grow up in the United States. I was born and raised in Germany and came uh, here to this country in my late 20s to do postgraduate work in music. And then I got my doctorate in music in education and then moved on into management consulting. And that was in the 90s, and I had gotten really good at consulting, yet I felt really despaired around intimate relationship. I had this pattern of attracting unavailable men, and while that was exciting, most of the time I was alone. And there came this distinct moment, this, I mean, despaired moment when I looked at my trajectory. If I was not going to change it, I would end up without lasting intimacy and love in my life before I were going to leave this planet. And I was not willing to settle for that. That was the moment when I decided to delve deeply into studying Tantra, not reading a book here or there, but really immersing myself. And, you know, Charlie, what opened up was that, and, and my intention for the work was to see what I was blind to, that brought an unavailability into my life. And what I discovered was that I was not available because what was underneath what a sense was a sense of distrust towards men. And I had not known about that. And given that the tantric practice is so integrative, like where our physical, sexual, emotional love and mental and spiritual self get touched in, tapped into for healing purposes so I could discover places within myself on the cellular level, like the memory there, that is not accessible through the conscious mind. So not through linguistics, not through talking about it. And that was a phenomenal healing that then allowed me to trust myself more deeply, trusting men in general more deeply. And then six months later came Freddie into my life. And I'm sure I would not have noticed him as a potential partner. I would have seen him, but not as a potential partner. If I hadn't cleared that availability thing, he was available. If I had not been available, that would not have been a magnetism and attraction. Interesting. Interesting. So what about you, Freddie? What what brought you to this type of work? Yeah, well, you know, Elspeth's story is great because it really illustrates what's possible with this as a transformational vehicle. Um, you know, her wanting on the surface to find available men and then in the, in the background running, not trusting men from her early experience. I was first introduced to these practices when I was 13 years old. I was living in Hawaii, going through my puberty, spending a lot of time in the shower, <laughs> like a lot of guys are at that age at that time. 
And my father at the time was a practicing psychiatrist, took pity on me and gave me a book to read on how to integrate sex and meditation. Wow, sexual meditation. Well, I loved it. My girlfriend loved it. And he, even more than that, kind of like Elsbeth's story, I had a desire, a dream, a wish to go on to college on an athletic scholarship, but didn't believe that I could get the training, the exposure, living in Hawaii, playing in Hawaii. Well, the practices assisted me to shift my belief, get past what I thought on the surface, and then really integrate left brain, right brain. Uh, and I went on to college and athletic scholarship. After college, I was in the software business for a long time in San Francisco. And initially, I loved it. It was exciting and new. And then after about 15 years, it was just a job. Uh, knowing what I knew about my own life and engagement, because I continue to do these practices in my personal life and uh, read books and workshops and apply them, apply these principles in my personal relationships. I was missing that engagement. There was an opportunity in Chicago. Company uh, hired me and moved me here. And that was 23 years ago. And I really came here to meet Elsbeth because at the time I was single, looking for Shakti, a female tantra partner online, and her profile showed up. And we met, and almost six months to the day, uh, we transcended what I call the romantic drama and created this work. And that was 23 years ago. Wow, you both um, kind of went different, separate ways, but then came together in the end. And that's beautiful. So you both mentioned Tantra. For those of us who are not aware of what Tantra is or what tantric practices are, can you give us an illustration of what those are? Elizabeth, mm -hmm. would you, will you start with me? Yeah, thank you. Well, this question. So Tantra is the yoga of the energetic body, the original yoga of the energetic body. Unlike the form of yoga that most of us in the West are familiar with, which is the yoga of the physical body, like Hatha yoga. So while we move the body in the yoga of the physical body, in the yoga of the energetic body, we tune with energy and learn how to move and channel energy, both in subtle states and then also in aroused states. And there is something that none of us got introduced to, which is our human energy. I mean, did you have a class in high school or college that were teaching you human energy? I right? did not. I did right. Not. So you probably <laughs> like we learned about electrical energy or nuclear energy, but it's curious not about human energy. However, it's the most powerful energy there is because it brings forth life. And this is the energy that runs through us our entire life. We receive it on at conception and it leaves us when we leave this planet. And so we can learn to tune with that energy and learn how it shows up within us, like showing up on the physical level when it shows up as a sensation, like feeling hot or cold, or an orgasm is in a sensation. On an emotional level, it shows up like love, hate, anger, joy, bliss. And on a mental level, it shows up as our thoughts, as our narratives, you know, internal conversations and commentary that goes on all the time. So that is what we want to tell, of course. And then our spiritual self, which is pure frequency, pure energy. So in the tantric practice, we get the opportunity to realign, reintegrate ourselves that may have become compartmentalized while we grew up in order to cope. Once we are integrated from our sexual, emotional, mental, and spiritual self, the flow is open. We feel whole. We feel well. There is ease. And that is what we can cultivate through the tantric practice. Wow, that was really interesting. Thank you for that. So, Freddie, can you help us understand how the use of this tantric practice or practices can help us define what intimacy is and in, in our search for that in relationships? Absolutely. Great question. Um, you know, the sexual energetic aliveness is an interesting approach to transformation. There's many ways we can get to see something, uh, get actionable insights about how to shift something in our life, therapy, nature walks, uh, meditation retreats. But few I know teach how to work with the life force of sexual energy as a transform transformational vehicle. 
So whether you're doing our work or transformational work or not, when you're in your sexual energy, you are more open, loving, vulnerable, receptive. Chemically, we're changed. More endorphins, serotonin, oxytocin, the feel-good hormones. So learning the distinctions that we teach, breath awareness, energy awareness, and intention, like I want to create a beloved or create more loving relationship in my relationships. What happens in that intimate, vulnerable, altered state of consciousness with those awarenesses of breath, energy, and intention, we get more exposed to our subconscious aspects of our beingness to really start to integrate what we want consciously and what's happening unconsciously. So we can move energy and start to lock in, if you will, what we really will most deeply desire. Uh, and we see oftentimes in those places where we have been blocking ourselves from creating and allowing in what we most deeply desire. So that's really the, what the, the secret sauce is to working consciously with life force of sexual energy. And darling, say this about intimacy. What do you always say? Oh, you're into me, I see. Into me, mm -hmm. I see. You know, really and also, if I may build on it, mm -hmm. is uh, what Freddie, you know, spoke about uh becoming aware of our sexual self in that way so that our emotional and our sexual intimacy, we want to have this go hand in hand. So in our work, for example, we never go right to arouse sexual energy in our teachings because if, I mean, be it in Freddie Smith's workshop or my Awaken to Your Feminine Essence workshop or our co workshops for couples and singles, because if we were to go there right away, nothing would change because the nervous system is used to a certain way of interacting, engaging with our sexual self. And that was learned decades ago. You know, that is mm -hmm. built, no, it's imprinted in the nervous system. So if we want to open up a new way of engaging with that energy so that it can fuel us and we can channel it and circulate within and circulate in relationship with the beloved, we first want to become aware of subtle energy. And that is why we start out with teaching how to cultivate deeper emotional intimacy with self, mm -hmm. partner, be that the beloved or be that a practice partner. And then once that has settled in, we move to getting the sexual energy involved because then the awareness is higher and that is the time to do it. Interesting. I do appreciate starting with yourself, just like you mentioned, Freddie, that into me I see before you can even seek to, to seek anything else in someone else. Something that you just mentioned, Elsa, was very interesting to me. Um, you use the word beloved. Is there some significance around that particular term or it's just the word you like to use? I love to use it. I find it very poetic, mm -hmm. more poetic than lover, although a lover is a beautiful word as well. Beloved, really, we also, in, sometimes in religion, you know, this word is used of the higher self oh, or oh, Jesus, Mohammed, or... The word also be, because it's like to create something is to be and then to do and then you have. So once you encapsulate the feeling, the, the frequency of something, and then you do that thing, then you have that thing. So the be, love it. <laughs> be love you be love it <laughs> never heard you say that before this is I love it. it i really like how you break down the words Freddie. that's really nice i like that language is really important you know the linguistic and how we speak from the subconscious often in what we say as well absolutely absolutely and you did mention Freddie, some distinctions of human relationship mastery how that's mastered can you go into or share with us what those what the rest of those dimension distinctions are and what they mean how you can you know relate them in a, a practical sense yeah. yeah you know elspeth wrote that book so i'm gonna let her talk about that we wrote the other one together but she wrote that book so yeah so so i want to point out a key distinction in the context of uh, our conversation here um, which has to do with becoming aware of different relational models, because that is so relevant in relationship today. And there are other aspects, as you mentioned, there are five distinctions. Let's focus on the, the relationship models. So we all grew up 
in our lifetime as well over generations in a hierarchical model, model of vertical model, as it shows up in patriarchy. Now, if we had matriarchy, it would be the same. So it, it, uh, switching around wouldn't change it because that is the structure. And of, of course, most of you are just listening here on this podcast. You cannot see what, you know, where my hands are. Let me describe it. One hand is up and the other hand is vertically down underneath the upper hand, illustrating the vertical relationship where one is up and one is down. Historically, males have been up, the masculine, the female and the feminine has been down. Now, of course, in my relationship with Freddie, there are moments where I am up, like when I get angry and become self-righteous. That never happens, though. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And I'm sure I'm right and he is wrong. I'm in the upper position and I put him in the lower position. So again, I want to point out, this is not nowadays just a man up, woman down. Not like that. However, still these structures are, are in our society. And um, in this model, the one who is up doesn't need or think he, he, she thinks doesn't need to listen to the one who is in the lower position because the world as it occurs for the one in the upper position is how the world looks, you know? So like knowing it all, what we are proposing, and this is not our brainchild, but we are moving it forward to move out of a a hierarchical relational model, model into a horizontal model. So now my right hand is horizontally across from my left hand, and they are now equal, the two people, yet different. And we want to become more aware of the differences because the differences uh, contribute to the relationship. And in this model, there are very particular actions, behaviors we want to cultivate further. Like we want to be able to receive as we want to be able to give. If I can only give, need to be in control, I not only rob the other of not giving to me, but also I don't know what that feels like. And ultimately I cannot trust because receiving calls for trusting, giving calls for holding, being grounded, you know, and other verb pairs like leading and following, mm -hmm. um, or um, what is the other one there? Oh, uh, speaking and listening, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is essential in couples work when we wanna create a harmonious relationship where we both, you know, can move like in the infinity flow. One is up in the sense of leading one moment, the other one is following, and then the second one is leading and the first one is following. It's like leading. Vesuvius, the improvisationally moving with the uh, polarity exchange, you know, as change polarities happen in relationship. And if we aren't aware of what's going on emotionally and energetically, being able to be a little bit self-aware then we're just stuck in making something wrong and not feeling like something's right and making the yeah. other wrong and so and, on. And this is really to the core of, you know, when couples fight or when we fight in relationship, when we fight in organizations, when countries fight amongst each other, it's, it's the same principle throughout the various ways how that shows up in society given that we work, you know, with singles and couples, it's really how can we create our relationship at that as that place of love and intimacy. And if we stay in anger and self-righteousness for a long time, those are the arch enemies of intimacy and love. Hmm, interesting. And so what I hear a lot of what you're saying is the need for both partners or even with yourself, the need for vulnerability. Can you speak to how vulnerability shows up or, or lack thereof or how that plays into the part of being sexually enlightened? 
Absolutely. So, you know, uh, intimacy shows up when we are in our sexual aliveness, sexual awareness with ourselves or with our partners. So when when we are, when I am in that energy, then I am, again, more intimately vulnerable and receptive. When I can bring consciousness to that state, you know, as a meditation, sexual meditation, then that becomes more familiar and available in outside of the bedroom, in my listening. So um, when I bring consciousness into sexual meditation uh, and I'm listening frequency wise, listening to my emotional self, listening to a story around something I want to create and what keeps me from doing that, just flowing in that. Then when I'm in my regular life, if I said, oh, well, I hate my job, 30 more years of retirement. That dog doesn't hunt anymore because what that does is the energetic cascade, the total felt sense of a thought when I'm listening to my energy doesn't isn't something I want to create. So I start listening differently, feeling differently, hearing, experiencing differently and becoming more source of my experience as opposed to being subjected to my life, you know, where we're running around resigned to, you know, the weather or what she said or he's or my life. So the real key about this in the bottom line is how can we be more self-expressed uh, and live and dance this life while we got it? And vulnerability also opens up to listen to each other, you know, and and that is and share so ourselves to even speak what what's there for us, yeah, honestly, and and to allow myself to get unmasked in my relationship, you know, instead of holding pretense and so they are both individual practices and couple practices you know where we instead of staying in our anger we open our heart which is a more vulnerable yet also more promising place and you know then there are heart to heart mm -hmm. uh, connection practices for the couple that that um, mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. do you wanna okay go ahead so great. So where we can, you know, breathe together, breathe in together. So what we are doing here is like we have, I have my left hand on Freddie's heart center. He has his left hand on my heart center. We look into each other's left eye because the left eye is correlated to the right brain hemisphere. And that is the Vesuvius, the experiential, the feeling, the autistic side of the brain. So we can connect right into the feeling state with each other. And then we start breathing together, synchronize breath, breathing in together and breathing out together. On the exhale, we send love from our heart center into the other's heart center. On the inhalation, we receive the love from the beloved in our heart center. And on the exhalation, we send. So you can see we have a circuit here. And then we feel connected. And when we synchronize our breath, we become one breath. So we have these practices also in our everyday life. So instead of remaining in anger, and, you know, holding something against the other. We agreed quite a while ago that instead of that, we take a deep breath in and one comes to the other. And when one comes to the other, the other is open to drop into that heart connection, which may not always that easy, particularly when I'm angry, you know? Yeah, and you know... <laughs> It's in that intimate, vulnerable moment that you can share something that might be there for you. And if the other is aligned with that, with that listening, then they can they can let you have that space to, to speak that. And that's the kind of intimacy that we're talking about in relationships that's often missed because that's not what we learn in our families. You know, shut up, don't you deign to question my authority. That's what we learn. Mm -hmm. And in you know, a whole uh, you know, schooling process, you know. So rediscovering our 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 um, you know, sovereign selves and being able to express ourselves as a process <laughs> Re rediscovering it I call it. absolutely and for our listeners of course you could necessarily see um see that interchange that they just had but I know that it was palpable I could see and feel the connection that you guys had in just that few moments um and so being able to cre recreate that for couples is probably a very powerful experience for both you and for them I would assume right 
especially if they come in with some kind of like ongoing yang, 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 because mm-hmm. that that just leads you right to am I going to hold on to that or am I going to let it go? Is there something right. I got to say to let it go? You know, and so that's the opportunity to be again intimately expressed because yeah. again and, part of a process. And Charlie, the beauty of the practice it uh, practice is that we drop from our busy mind, which where self-righteousness lives, into the heart. And the heart is the connector, connector with self and connector with other automatically. So our energy focus shifts into the heart and the heart is always forgiving and opening. I mean, yeah, you could call it the, the you know, unified field or the super consciousness or, you know, sometimes people listen to this and go, oh, this sounds a little woo-woo, you know. But what's <laughs> really woo-woo are single-celled amoebas, multi-celled organisms, and a universe that goes on for ad infinitum. And that's our lineage. We're just beginning to uncover what we are part of. And sexual energy was creating life before we had language. And, you know, when you bring consciousness to the sexual, the kernel, the essence of that energy, creativity and pleasure, starts showing up in areas of life that seem completely unrelated to sex in the simple process of living. Sexual meditation. Don't live without it. (laughs) Interesting. Interesting. And speaking of sexual energy, so what are some ways to harness that sexual energy? We mentioned um, being open and being vulnerable with each other, but what are some other ways that, that a couple or a single is able to do that? Yeah. Um, so, Charlie, the the center of focus that we want to become aware of are these four dimensions, the physical, sexual, the heart, the emotional, <clears throat> the mental, what goes on in our thought world, and the spiritual or cosmic or consciousness, higher consciousness that we are all part of, you know, and so that focus on our sexual center as a place to bring awareness to, because that is something that we don't learn. We actually learn more when we are kids don't go there until you're married or it's sinful, like as if that energy was bad, you know, Mm -hmm. and that hangs around then consciously or unconsciously. And it's our life force energy. So when I vilify that energy, it's not only in the sexual experiential realm, it's my life force energy gets diminished. And we want to bring awareness to that life force that is sexual in nature. Life force and sexual energy are not different energies. They are the same. It just shows up, this energy shows up at different gradations, like it's right now more on a subtle state and then when i walk at by lake michigan in the summer you know i feel the breeze on my skin i'm not highly aroused but it feels quite pleasant and then all the way up to the aroused state to the climax the same energy at different gradations so we can learn to play that energy at different gradations just like we learn to play a flute with different pitches and we play it and we can stay on a five on a scale from one to ten can move up to an eight down to a two we can then do this together together it only works if both partner partners have familiarity with it individually so the sexual meditation that we uh, want to give as a gift is cultivated as solo practice, and then we can bring it into couplehood. All right. So you mentioned a gift. Can you tell us more about this gift you have for us now? Absolutely. I love to. <laughs> So yeah, we thought out of this conversation, you know, some curiosity may have arisen Mm -hmm. for you, the listener. And so to let you not hang out there, so what does that mean? Or how can I learn this? So we thought Mm -hmm. we just would give you a video class of how to cultivate sexual meditation. And the practices we teach in that class are foundational. They deal with your subtle energy so that you become more familiar with that energy. Because once you open the channel of your energy centers or vortices and there is a flow, then it's easy to move to uh, running uh, aroused energy. So that video class will 
give you practices that you can take into your everyday everyday life right away. Awesome. Thank you for that. Because just in our um, conversation and my short amount of research into you guys coming onto our show today, I was very intrigued um, and find it to be quite fascinating. And, and as you mentioned, this isn't something that we grow up talking about. I am from the South and we do not discuss sexual energy at all. It's a big taboo, a big no-no. Um, and so I wasn't sure where to even start to go after this. So thank you very much for that, this class. And so this introduction to sexual meditation is something that I know I will personally um, be taking advantage of. But outside of the outside of this class, how would someone start this process? Um, or once you, as a single, have, have researched and done your your, your work on self-meditation, how would a couple go about bringing this type of deeper level of intimacy and connection to their relationship? Mm. Well, if they come to a workshop, they'll learn everything they need to learn. Um, you know, this isn't really teaching anyone anything they didn't know. It's reminding them of what they've forgotten, mm. you know, because when we start out in the womb, it's womb service, you know, and it's just wonderful. We aren't thinking. It's just like effortless. And then our brains develop, we're born, and, you know, whoosh, whack, you know, on the bottom, bright lights, you know, some guys are getting their wee-wees cut and thinking, send me back, you know, and life <laughs> happens, all this stuff happens, the good, the bad, right, the wrong, the rainy days, money days, and then we get to a point in our life where we want to create something that we've never experienced before, perhaps in relationship or whatever it might be. And these are the practices to get out of our own way, what I call it the clay that we've learned that we look into the world from, you know, from all the experiences, to move into a new possibility. So, um, yeah, to start, come to a workshop, do your research, and uh, yeah, that's the beginning. A good place also to learn further, in addition to the sacral meditation class, is to get our book, either in hard copy or order your form, um, it's right on our website. Also, you may have it in the show notes. I understand. Beautiful. So that's a great way to learn a little bit more of the background, what's behind it historically, theoretically, how that is, you know, uh, makes sense in the mm -hmm. biology mm -hmm. of our being. And I want to say one more thing about sexual meditation, which has to do with for the sake of what? Are we doing it? You know, so there is a pleasure aspect that we can cultivate that energy to increase and expand our capacity of experiencing pleasure, not only locally in our sexual center, yet all over throughout our body. Another aspect is the connection between our sexual self and our heart self that embellishes the heart, opens our love self. And when we are integrated between our sex and our heart, we actually feel more complete and whole and can share ourselves more fully. And then we can connect with that sexual life force energy, using it to fuel the connection with our spiritual self so that my sexual self communicates with my spiritual self and my spiritual self informs my sexual self. And it goes back and forth. You probably get already a sense of how, you know, how all encompassing mm -hmm. and ending that may be and then we can use this aroused energy and channel it into what we want to create in the world into projects you know when we wrote the book we used sexual meditation to get out of our head and move into the flow of writing instead of having writer's block so there are multiple purposes what we can use it for and that awareness of channeling energy, both emotional, love, and sexual energy, plays then out in relationship, where we can connect heart to heart, sex to sex, or circulate from the man's sexual center into his heart, mm -hmm. into my heart, into my sexual center, and then we have a circuit again. Wow. Microcosmic orbit. <laughs> this is really cool. Wow. Okay. Um, so is there like a hallmark story that you guys can share with us about this the, this power of sexual enlightenment or how you've been able to guide a couple or even a group through this model? What did, what did the level of success look like? What did that feel like for the participant? Yeah, I have one. So this 
particular couple came to us. Uh, she was a judge and he was a retired uh, sergeant or undercover officer with the New York Police Department. And uh, he they had a, a son who was older, like in his 20s, who had died. And they loved each other very much. And, and they couldn't come together intimately because whenever they did, they would get depressed and guilty and start mourning. So they found us on the internet and they came and they wanted to find a way to get out of that, that, that sadness that they felt. So through the practices, the sexual meditation practices, through the insightful uh, processes that we led them through over private uh, sessions, uh, three-day sessions, they were able to get what we call some distance from that morning to put it in a place that they could put it like on a windowsill where they could visit it every now and then but not be lost in it. And it was through the altered state of the sexual meditations that they were able to get some distance in that altered state, again, chemically and emotionally, to, to, to put it in its place, to get some, as again, distance or flattening it, the emotion. And that's a, that's a really, and they're, they're good today. We've seen them many times and they're, they're doing great. So that, that's just one example of hundreds of people, thousands of people we've worked with over the 23 years we've been doing this. And they weren't necessarily meditators. They were just real world people. <laughs> you know, <laughs> nice. And so, are your workshops are they in person? Tell me more about those workshops. Yes. So our COVID workshops are all in person here at the institute in Chicago, the Tantranova Institute. Right. Freddie teaches a, a men's workshop called Men, Sex, and Power where he teach actually se sexual meditation, the guys that they then do as homework in the evening on, you know, one night of the workshop, the weekend workshop. And I teach an all women's workshop, which is called Awaken to Your Feminine Essence, where I also teach that sexual meditation, I call it self-love practice, where I become the beloved and the lover at the same time. You know, the lover who comes to me that I wish would listen to me and treat me and all of it. I am that lover listening to myself, to the beloved within, and then exploring myself sensually and uh, sexually and l loving myself truly. And that is always a huge opening for women. Mm. Um, to encounter themselves in this way. Both workshops, the one for men and the one for women, they are hybrid. So some participants come here in person and some in the room are participating on Zoom. So even if you cannot travel, mm -hmm. uh, that's a good way of getting started. The COVID workshops, it's a little different because you either work with your partner, your committed partner, or if you come solo as a single person, you pair up with a practice partner and you want to be in the same room. You have to be, otherwise it won't work. So, and many, many people also appreciate very much to do that work in person because there's an immediacy there. Right. And then, of course, we offer pro private programs that people can sign up for that then can also be taken over Zoom. Nice, okay. So where can our listeners learn more about your work, learn more about where to find the um, the programs that you do, the conferences, the retreats, where can, where can our listeners find more about you? Yeah, the best place for that is really tantranova.com, our right. website, T-A-N-T-R-A-N-O-V-A, tantranova.com. Everything is available there. Then the book, there are also, there's a download, the 10 uh, practices called Creating Intimacy and Love, right on the homepage. When you go to the uh, program page, there is a layout of all the programs, workshops, private programs. And then, of course, also, uh, you know, oh, Freddie is also jazzing us. So there's a theater page. I can, can listen to his creative self singing. It's a passion. I love it. And uh, so it's just also fun just to cruise around on our website because there are, you know, various thing to be, things to be di discovered. And then on YouTube, we have lots of, you know, videos, Tantra okay. Noir, 
uh, that's another way. Um, and then on Amazon, just look up sexual enlightenment, you know, how to create lasting fulfillment in life, love and intimacy. It's right there. Awesome. Thank you very much. And before I let you guys go, can you leave us with a final word on the power of sexual enlightenment and the inspired life that people can live after finding this level of connection? Well, I would say for all of us to continue to be our own witness and begin to practice owning our upsets. So quickly to be able to be watching ourselves in our upsets because it looks like it's a reason for the, the what they did or what the weather is. So keep owning what's behind your energy about it. Uh, and then there may be a request to be made or something, but to keep owning our, our upsets. And for me, I would say, connect with your heart and open your heart both to yourself and that will open your heart to another. And that's the reconciler. Stay curious. Very nice. Thank you both very much. Um, and again, thank you, Elizabeth and Freddie, for listening, or excuse me, speaking with us today. I really appreciate you being here with us. And thank you to our listeners for taking the time to join Elizabeth and Freddie today. Um, the resources for this episode and an archive of all of our other episodes can be found on our webpage at triadhq.com slash BHT. And we look forward to having you back with us next time on Behavioral Health Today. Mm -hmm.